It is a pleasure to address you today with a message that is of uh, tremendous importance and significance for the Adventist Church. But let me begin by reading a couple of statements uh, by Ellen G. White that it would be good for you to keep in mind as I uh, continue with the devotional. The first one is taken from Evangelism, page 187. Of the professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the Lord. The second one is taken from Evangelism, page 190. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. The three angels' messages. I'm going to suggest to you that these messages are about the gospel. They are about Christ Jesus and the work he is doing. He did, he is doing, and he will do for his people. If you read the verses, Genesis 14, 6 through 12, you will notice that at the very beginning, the first message, the gospel is mentioned, the eternal gospel. Then in verse 10, you have a reference to the Lamb. The Lamb of God, the means through which the gospel reached us. And at the end, in verse 12, you have a reference to the faith of Jesus. That is to say, the faith that we place on him as our Savior. So that the messages are moving, revolving around the gospel. A tremendous challenge for us, and I'm going to say it from the very beginning. The challenge is preaching the gospel. So let's begin with the, with the first message. The first message, John sees an angel flying through the heavens, shouting with a powerful voice. And what he's preaching is the eternal gospel of God. See, this is the message. The interesting thing is that he doesn't develop this topic. He doesn't begin to discuss for us what is the gospel. No. He simply says, this is the eternal gospel that has to be preached to the whole world. The eternal gospel. It, it, it's eternal because it was, it was formulated by God. By the Godhead. It, it was formulated in the mind of the Godhead in eternity. And it remained hidden there until Christ came and the gospel became visible, began to be proclaimed in his person and his ministry, eternal gospel. And the results, the benefits, good or bad, of the gospel are also eternal. It's a wonderful message that we need to preach. If you want to know what John means about the gospel, then you have to go through the gospel, to the, to the book of Revelation. Because there is not one place where he begins to develop the topic. This is normal. This is natural in apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature, it, it doesn't develop doctrinal topics like like the book of Romans you know where Paul talks about justification by faith chapter after chapter no in apocalyptic literature you have visionary circles you 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 have exhortations you know if you want to know what the gospel is then you have to go through the book of revelation what is the gospel in the book of revelation the book of revelation the gospel is the Lamb. That's, that's, that's what it is. You see, this is the main title of Jesus in the book of Revelation. The Lamb of God. 
This is the gospel incarnated in him. You want to know what the gospel is according to John the Revelator? Look at the Lamb. There he is. And if you go to chapter 5, verse 11, the first time in chapter 5 that the, that the Lamb appears in the book of Revelation. And, and you have the, 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 the scroll in the hand of God. And, and, and they are looking for somebody who can take the scroll and open it. And there appears the Lamb, slain Lamb. It's there. And when the, when the 24 elders and the four living creatures see him, they fell down to worship him. And they shouted, worthy is the Lamb to get the book and open it. Worthy is it. And the question is, why is he worthy? He is worthy, according to verse 11, because he gave his life to redeem the human race. Through his blood, he redeemed human beings for the kingdom of God. That's the gospel. Keep on reading the book, and you will see there that this, this lamb hmm, uh, ministry on earth, and the dragon went against him in chapter 12, and he ascended to heaven. And then in chapter 5, we see him being enthroned in heaven, praised for the accomplishments of his sacrifice. And throughout the book of Revelation, you continue to see him ministering in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf. And we hear the news that he's coming a second time for his people. This is the gospel. There is not a chapter where John develops it, but you have pieces here and there. It's a wonderful gospel. The Son of God came and died for us in my place. To give me life, wonderful life, the good news, the gospel. Then the next thing in the first uh, message, the, thing, the next thing we hear is the altar call. The altar call. This is, this is interesting. You, you say, I, uh, the angel was proclaiming the gospel, saying... And, and then he's going to tell us what the angel was saying. But then he, he, he's really jumping to the altar call. How do, how, how do we know that this is the, the altar call? Because of the imperatives. Three imperatives. Fear God. Give glory to God. And worship him. You see, this is the call. When you invite people, you say, this is what you have to do. Because the gospel is good news. This is what you have to do. What do you have to do? You have to fear God. And that means simply, you have to look at the biblical God and see the beauty of this wonderful God. His majesty, his glory. Look at him in the biblical text and, and listen to him. And then choose him as your God. Choose him as your God. Submit to his will. As your God. This is what he means. And then he says, and give glory to him. This is an interesting phrase. Give glory to him. We give glory to God in different ways. But notice that the text doesn't say, and glorify him. It says, give glory to him. And if you look at the few places in the Bible where this phrase is used, this seems to be the basic significance, even in the context in which we find it here in, Gen in uh, Revelation. To give glory to God is to be willing to proclaim him as a righteous judge. To be willing to say you are a righteous God and the case you have against me as a sinner, as a sinner is right. It's right. I deserve that. You are a righteous God. This is what we call the justification of God. Declaring that God is right when he judges sinners. This is the call. To go back to God. To proclaim him as a righteous judge. 
and to worship him. Life, that's what worship is about. Worship is about life. It's about bowing down, surrendering our lives to the source of life. And the reason for doing this is the hour of the judgment has come and God created everything. The hour of the judgment, it means that the judgment is taking place right now. Right now. This is the day of atonement in chapter 11, verse 19. John says that the heavens were open and he was taken inside the most holy place, the day of atonement. We are in the day of atonement. The prophetic periods have ended. We are in the day of atonement. There's still chance. The Lord is calling people to repent, to accept him, to glorify him. But notice that in this, in this message, two commandments are mentioned. Worship God, the first. And the phrase that he uses here is worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and spring of waters. It has been correctly said that this phrase is taken basically almost taken verbatim from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, that will remind human means not to worship the dragon, but to worship God. Now the second message, the second message is a very short one. Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. What is Babylon? I'm going to tell you very briefly. Babylon is a false gospel. Babylon is the most powerful invention that the dragon has been able to create. And he entrusted to this system a false gospel. And the good news is that the false gospel will fail. And the true gospel will be triumphant. Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon in the Old Testament. Associated from the very beginning in chapter Genesis 11. From the very beginning. Associated with human pride. Uh, human pr pride and, and self-sufficiency. That's what I meant. Self-sufficiency. Humans trying to, to create a system that will preserve them alive in the future. But the best passage about Babylon is really Isaiah 14. A very important chapter for us as Adventists. There's a description, a discussion of the fall of Babylon. And the language of the fallen cherub is used to describe the intentions and goals of Babylon and the king of Babylon. In the middle of this discussion about the king, all of a sudden we hear a reference to Lucifer in heaven, saying, I will ascend to the heavens. Genesis 11, I will ascend to the heavens and I will sit on the throne as God. There you have it. That's what Babylon is. The creature trying to take the place of God with a false message of salvation. In Revelation, this is very powerful in Revelation. In Revelation, Babylon is, is the, the end time Babylon is, is formed by three elements. The first one is the beast from the, from the sea in, in, in Revelation 13, representing Christianity during the Middle Ages. And then you have the, the beast from, from the earth, representing Protestantism as represented in, in America. So that the, 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 the plan of the enemy is to take divided apostate Christianity and unify it to promote his message, to promote his aspirations around the world. Babylon... If you look at chapter 18, Revelation 18, and compare it with the message to Laodicea, you will find that Babylon 
is a sect segment of Christianity that they did not listen to the Laodicean message. Babylon was rich, had plenty, plenty dresses, they don't need Christ, apostate Christianity. But there is more, you see, Babylon is not simply the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, is also the dragon. Satan himself working. You see, the message of Satan is not only for the Christian world, it's for the whole world. So, so he's, he's going to move to the rest of the world with miracles to persuade them to support the agenda of apostate Christianity. The changes that are coming to this planet, we cannot even begin to imagine. This is a very diversified planet. Difficult to imagine that people will group in two for the lamb, for the dragon. Yet, this is what the prophecy is saying that is going to happen and it's going to happen with tremendous miracles. The third message. It's a message, it's a message that, that seeks to awake human beings. And he says, well, listen, human beings, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstorm in the presence of the angels and in the presence of the, of the Lamb. This is, a, this is, this is a, a, a very powerful message, isn't it? The people get scared when they listen to this message. But I say to you, this message is about the gospel. The first message was about the gospel. The second message is about a false gospel that is going to fall, to be, to be destroyed by, by the true gospel. And this one is also about the gospel. And it alerts human beings not to take the name of the beast, to, 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 uh, to take the character of the beast on themselves, not to take the number of the beast, the identity of the beast, and not to take the mark, the visible element that shows loyalty to the beast. And I think we are right when we say it is particularly Sunday. Perhaps we need to think a little more about the significance of Sunday. I'm going to tell you that Sunday was, from the demonic perspective, a tremendous invention. Tremendous invention. The enemy, Lucifer, was able, in one act, to put together his intentions his goals, what he wanted, just in one act. Let me explain. There you have it. We call it a false day of rest versus Sabbath, a full, uh, the, the correct day of rest. But, but I, I think we need to change the emphasis in order to see the significance of this. See, Sunday is not a false day of rest. Sunday is a false day of worship. And, and the seventh day is the right day of worship. You see, you have to put this in the proper perspective. By doing that, that is to say, by making Sunday a day of worship, the enemy was able to put together his package in a very simple way. What is it that he originally wanted? He wanted to change the law because the law of God was not right. So he wanted to change it and he wanted worship. And by changing the law in one simple place, he accomplished, he's going to accomplish both purposes. Change of the law, Sunday, self-worship on Sunday. The two together, very simple, very powerful. And this will go throughout the world as a sign and as a symbol of the power 
the authority and the aspirations of the enemy. Then the wrath of God. We have here two metaphors in this passage. You see, John is trying to help us understand what is the wrath of God. And he says, it is, it is like a, a cup of wine. A, a wine that has not been mixed with water, but that has been mixed with other elements to increase its intoxicating power. That's what the wrath of God is. It's wine and mixed, not mixed. So in order to tell us that the, at this point in the final judgment, the wrath of God comes without mercy. Whatever the wrath of God, John says, is at this point is going to be without mercy, without grace. The second metaphor he uses is fire. Fire and brimstone, sulfur. So, so, so the, the, the wrath of God is, is, is something that can be compared to, to your experience when you get burned by fire and sulfur. It's intense, intense, very intense. And the purpose of the metaphor is to say the result of God's wrath is eternal. It brings the second death. But there is something in this message that we need to pay a little attention to. It's the phrase, and they were tormented in the presence of the angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Very difficult phrase. See, the first, thing we, the first thing we imagine is that these people are, are being tormented and Christ and his angels are there looking at them. I have good news. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. What is this image of Jesus, the angels and Jesus? What is that? If I ask an Adventist, when I, when I say Jesus and his angels, what is it that comes to mind? Immediately, the second coming. The theophany of Christ coming in glory. That's what comes to mind. And John is using that image to tell us that in the final judgment, when the wicked and Satan and his demons are there, Christ is going to come to them. There's going to be a, a theophany, or if you please, a Christophany. He's going to appear before them. The last apparition of Christ to the wicked. Right there. Now, if you look carefully at the text, the text doesn't say the angels and Christ or Jesus. It says before the angels and the Lamb. The Lamb. You remember I told you in the book of Revelation, the Lamb is the gospel. See, what is going to happen that day in the judgment is that Christ is going to appear, that the Lamb of God is going to appear. And they are going to look at the Lamb, at the sacrifice of Christ. They are going to be looking at the cross of Jesus Christ in the final judgment. This is not new for us. We believe that the love of God will overcome the forces of evil. And right there, the wicked are looking and they are looking at Jesus. Why at the Lamb? Why at the Lamb? Because this is the best and only evidence God has to defeat them. The last evidence. It doesn't have anything else. Because on the cross, God displayed like never before his love, his mercy, his justice, a tremendous revelation. And now the wicked in the court of law, they have to look at this evidence. The love of God. Now I'm going to say this. And you may have to think about this later, but I'm going to say it to you. Here it is. 
what is tormenting the wicked is the love of God. They look at him and they see this wonderful love and their guilt becomes alive. And they see that the charges they had against God were false. That he's the most loving being in the universe. And they begin to feel divine abandonment like never before. You see, if you want to have an idea about what is going through them, go and read and study the experience of Jesus on the cross. Where he felt totally abandoned by the Father and shouted, Oh, I'm thirsty for God. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is the despair, the torment of the wicked as they look at the cross of Jesus. The evidence. The evidence. Now, I'm not creating this out of nothing. I'll tell you why talks about this. She talks about this moment in Great Controversy, pages 664. And she says, there is a moment when the throne of Christ goes up above the walls of the city. And he's shouted by the glory of God. And she says, behind him is the cross. You see, this is what the wicked are going to be looking at the cross. What happened there? And they will understand why they are going to be left outside the city. Why they are going to go to eternal death. She writes. Looking at the mysterious victim. The sinners will stand condemned. You see what condemned them? This mysterious victim, the Lamb of God. It is about the gospel. The gospel will bring the cosmic conflict to an end. Now, I, uh, as I conclude, well, allow, uh, please allow this old man to give you a, a word of counsel if, if possible. This is the message that we have to proclaim. We have to take every one of our doctrines, every aspect of our the Adventist lifestyle, and frame them around the cross, the sacrifice of Christ. So this is my advice. Go to the division, your division, your unions, the conferences, local fields. Encourage everyone, every church member to understand the gospel of salvation by faith through Christ and to allow the love of the cross to transform them. Ask the teachers in your colleges, universities, everywhere to present to the students, to the, to the students, the lamb on the cross. Everything that we talk about has to be touched by the cross. And allow me one more thing. Go and make every one of our buildings a place where the gospel is proclaimed through the word and through our actions. Let everything we do being kindness and love to each other and to the world. But above all, continue in your task, in the fulfillment of the mission of the church. Continue in that task, going out, proclaiming the gospel to everyone around the world. May the Lord bless you as you accomplish the mission of, of the three angels of Revelation. Blessings to you.